Good afternoon, greater Philadelphia area. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Time, and we've got Gabe behind the camera. And we've got some interesting stuff, as always. A little off topic this week. We got a guest coming in later. Hope he shows up. If not, we'll we'll wing it here for the third segment. So what we wanted to start with first, and again, we are, uh, Sarah and I work with the Tom Tool Sales Group, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018, and you can find us streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, just look up Tom Tool Sales Group. So, there was an article, I sent you this article, we had to go yep. back in the archives here, it's from CNBC in 2018, and I'm just going to read you the headline and some stats around it, and then we can talk through kind of what people thought, where we are now, and then also, are we seeing the same same news cycle again? I think that's the big question here. So okay. this was July 10th, 2018. CNBC, if you've heard of him, Scott Kahn wrote the article, the hottest housing market in the U.S. is up 13% and now be me- may be headed for a crash, period. I mean, that that's the headline. Then they talk about that um, home prices in Washington State rose up in the first quarter, more than 13% from a year ago. Strong job growth and tight supplies have fueled the housing market, leading to fear around a bubble. I mean, this bubble talk's been around for, for a long time. So what do you think about this, knowing where we are now, basically four years later? Yeah, I mean, I think that the concern here that would potentially allow it to at some point lead to a bubble would be um, if the inventory really like became readily available. Yes. So... Um, you know, it's it is interesting because it's this talk was going on four years ago, and it's the same situation. Uh, we've seen this year over year now since this came out of um, everything that they've been talking about in it, and it's it's no bubble. It's um, there's there are many people out there, and inventory is is still low. Well, what I, what I find interesting is that there's a couple things that are similar to 2018, and that rates are a little higher than they were the, the previous couple years, but also. You know, people were were so fearful of a bubble, and it's the exact opposite happened. I, mean, I did a little research on this. So if you look at the median home sale price from July until December uh, in, in the greater Philadelphia area, so that's, uh, it's, uh, it's Philadelphia, uh, Delaware, Chester, Montgomery counties, it was like a 307, right? You know what the, me- uh, the average sale price is right now? Is it up in like the 350s? $387,000 yeah. through the end of last year. So we've literally seen... I mean, you're talking about 25, 30% growth. Now, that's for all four counties. So, obviously, it's going to vary a little bit from here to there. So, the exact opposite has happened. So, you know, what a lot of people are saying is that there, a bubble's not even close. I mean, what, what, what's your take on this now, Sarah? Because I think this is – people are talking about, oh, the market's slowing down and it's decelerating, which there is some fact. But it, it's I'm, – I'm just not I'm, – I'm not seeing this bubble talk, and I think a lot of people kind of got to get real with what's actually happening right now. Right. Um, yeah, I I don't believe that there is that there is a bubble. Um, <laughs> I feel like we have seen a little bit of a, a shift, um, but nothing nothing what that would mean the market is completely flipping or or anything to that extreme. Um, certainly, the rise in interest rates has you know caused some people to change their plans a little bit or to you know change their expectations or or change their search a bit. Um, Inventory, we're hoping, will still creep up a little bit more, um, but it is still far too low to be a balanced market. I mean, we're you're at like six months of an inventory supply to to consider it a balanced mm-hmm. a balanced market, um, and we're looking at what tops two months. Um, so it's it hasn't shifted to any extremes. We've just we're at the very beginning of a little bit of a if you're in the industry that you've been able to notice you know, some slight subtle changes. Yeah, I, I would say it's it's a, it's a deceleration from the incredible market we've seen over the past two years. Because if you look at that, how that average sale price grew, it grew the most from 2020 to 2021 out, out of anywhere. And also it jumped up pretty substantially from 19 to 20, not those kind of the, the front and back end like we're talking about here. And w- what happens is because we are going really fast down the road, when you're going 150 and you slow down to like 90, I've never done 150. I don't know about you. <laughs> but it feels slower. I mean, it, it, no, no matter what, what happens. And if you look at mortgage rates, this is – and I have a question for you. I want to get your, your perspective on here in a second. 
If you look at historically rates since 1971, now this is the monthly average commitment rate, and then there's points. I'm not going to get into the, the, the points part, but in 2018, we saw rates, uh, April, they were 4.47, May was 4.59, June was 4.57. I mean, we saw like four and a half, and then it accelerated in kind of the October, November to 4.83, 4.87. Wait, what year are we in? That's 2018. Okay. So the rates were a, a little lower than where we're seeing them now coming in the, in, in the fives, but not much. And, right. and so I think that that's the funny part about all this is that we saw rates go up. Then they came back down. Then we know what happened in 2020 because of the stimulus to the economy because of the shutdowns. Mm -hmm. That I feel like the people that talk about rates the most are real estate agents and not actually consumers. Right, right. What do you think about that? Because I feel like a lot of people are worried about rates, but the people that really want to buy and sell, they're just concerned about finding a house or getting their home sold. Right. And I mean, I think that rates are something that it's all over the news or there's and there's definitely a lot of clickbait around it. And um you know, it's something that makes headlines. But absolutely to your point, when you need to buy or sell or this is something that you're actively doing, while it obviously is is a factor and something that you need to be aware of, if you need to buy and sell, you need to buy and sell, um, regardless of um, a little bit of a shift here. And it also, it is interesting that, you know, for where they are now, it's not that far off from where they were in 2018. And in 2018, I mean, that's better than it had been in you know, some of the other, le- well, we had a couple other like uh, good years there before that, but I'll tell you not what, though, that different. That demonstrates the point that rising rates don't mean the housing market's going to burst because if you look at 2017, I mean, rates were coming in high threes there for a little bit mm-hmm. um, in this, you know, in that uh, range of like June until the end of the year. 2016, we saw some rates in the threes. 2015, the same thing. So it's not like these rate. I mean, rates were pretty stable for a long time, mm-hmm. and then when they started going up in 2018, the market didn't slow down. I mean, 2018 right. and 2019 were pretty good years for real estate. Right, right, um, yeah. And I mean, and where they were in their highest in those years again is not that far off from where where it's reporting that they were for April. So mm-hmm. now I think that they have ticked up. Yes, then. yes. We know that. Um, so I think that we will kind of break the mold there for as you're just looking at this chart across the board, seeing something with a five in front of it is going to be different than what we've seen in the previous years. But if you factor out, you know, I think just seeing the five is scary. But if you look at the difference between like a 4.9 and a 5.2, I mean, it's it matters, but it's um, I think it's more of a shock for just like mm-hmm. seeing a five. Well, I mean, we haven't seen rates in the fives really unless again, Every situation is different. If you've got bad credit or you've got some some issues, you might see a higher rate. This is mm-hmm. based on 30-year fixed rates since 1971, and it comes from Freddie Mac. The last time we saw rates in the fives were you know back in, in 2009, but there were some people that had to you know go a little higher in, in 2018 when they kind of got to that 4.83, 4.87 mark mm-hmm. because their credit wasn't that, – that's for like A-plus credit. That's what people don't right. realize. So if you've got like a score in like the, the mid-sixes, you might have to pay a higher rate. That's just how it works. Right. So that's one indicator um, that – that this 2018 article is kind of nonsense, and I think it really demonstrates our point that we've been belaboring here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to go a little different direction with this. So Housing Wire and uh, Logan uh, Matashami, the uh, chief economist over there, um, he uh, he had an article that came out on the 19th, and what he had basically said is that the market's unhealthy, meaning that there's not enough sellers, too many buyers. I, we can all agree on that. Sure. And he actually says that the unhealthy housing market needs higher rates. Mm-hmm. And and what he meant by that is that uh, existing home sales for April came in at 5.61 million with double digit price growth. Um, and that's still driving the housing market. And he said the big game changer was that the 10 year yield finally cracked that uh, oh, that 1.94 percent mark where it hadn't really gone past in a while that drove mortgage rates up. And that's changed the tone of housing. So, so is he right there? Are interest rates rising a good thing for the market in terms of being more healthy and balanced? I think so. Um, you know, I think that that in itself isn't going to do it, but um, that it is it is a piece that could cool things down a little bit, give um, a chance for some days on market to accrue, um, and you know, kind of start to stir things a little bit. Um, you know, and it's it's one of those where when you're currently the buyer in this market, 
Um, that's the last thing that you want to hear. Mm -hmm. But uh, having those rates go up will have more of an effect than just you and your monthly payment. It'll it'll change uh, other buyers out there, and um, then that'll shift into sellers, and it'll uh, it will have an effect overall. Even at five and a half percent, inflation is coming in at eight point five percent. So you're still beating inflation right. versus putting your money in the stock market, for example. If people are looking at the investment side. Mm -hmm. To, to give some perspective on how buyers were made up through uh, in, in the month of April. So first-time home buyers made up 28% of the sales in April. It's a big percentage. Investors purchased 17% of homes. All cash sales accounted for 26% of transactions. Uh, and then distressed sales represented less than 1%. And properties remained on the market for 17 days. So you're seeing some first-time home buyers come to the market. You're seeing that that's, that's an incredible amount of high all cash sales. I was just going to say that. I was going to, that seems, that seems very high. So it I don't is. know what like a norm, like an average um, number would have been, but that's, and, and I believe it because as you're out there, I mean, there's, you, you compete against all cash offers and on the listing side, we get all cash offers. So um not that I was doubting his reporting, but sure. it's adding up. <laughs> well, so th there's um, some research from last year um, on NAR, just to give some perspective, and it talks about the number of cash sales. So, um, and that it's this is among non first time home buyers. So, a little different data set than what we've had before. Among non first time home buyers, cash sales in April of 21 were 33.5% compared to April of 2019, it was only 26.3%. So we're basically looking at a 7% increase here or so okay. in cap. But that's people that aren't first-time buyers. Right. So right. knowing that first-time home buyers made up 28%, we're only talking about 72% of the sales. Okay. So it, it, it is up pretty sharply there because first-time home buyers, I mean, they, they typically don't do that unless their parents are giving them the money or they've had some some incredible you know job opportunity or they right, inherited right. some money or, or whatever. So with that, what what he also says in this article, which I found pretty interesting, uh, was that he, uh, you know, last year he was talking about that we needed higher rates to cool down the market because it would it would do two things. It would cool down price growth and it would create more days on market. So that was February of last year. Now days on market nationally is at seventeen days. We're more we're at twenty three. So okay. and you, you may not think the six days make a big deal. Oh, it does. It makes a big deal. Oh yeah. Oh um, yeah. So it, we've seen that that's actually kind of, um, kind of kind of pushed it forward. Now the big difference here, though, is nationally, we saw a 2.3 month supply of homes in April of 2021, and now we're down to 2.2 months. But it that that's actually a bump from where it was because December, January, February, we saw very little inventory on the market, and we're seeing it start to rise again here. So with, with the the concept that rates are good for the market. Where do you think they are? They're going to top out, and where do you think? I mean, do you think buyers are going to actually like just pull out of the market entirely if they hit a certain number? I mean, are we going to see seven? Or are we going to see eight? What, what What do you think here? For this, like, for where it ends at the end of this year? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm hoping it's in the sixes. Okay. Um, I know that that's kind of wishful, wishful thinking here. Um, you know, I think we had a big. You know, in the last couple months, they really shot up relatively quickly. I think that they're going to continue to creep up throughout the year. Um, I don't know if they'll be as like big of jumps that hit all at once. Um, I'm thinking like mid sixes. Um, you know, maybe up to maybe up to seven. Okay, um, is where I would kind of see them see them landing at. Um, what what. Was there another question in there? I just wanted to get an idea where you think this is going to pull back because uh, my, my view is that, that the Fed's going to raise rates again, right? They're, they're, they're talking about doing this. I don't think it's going to slow down the market right. at all until we see supply get north of that like six month number. And then because that, that's what everyone's pointing towards. And we've got a long way to go. Right. Um, I, I don't I don't see rates even at six or seven percent. If, if they go that high, mm -hmm. there's going to be people that are just going to they're going to move. Right. It's just, they're they're going to move because they want to move. We're seeing that sales have declined a little bit because there's not that kind of inventory right now. I mean, we've got a fundamental supply and demand issue here, mm -hmm. and rates aren't going to stop that because there's how many buyers do you have that are that, like they're buying a house, right? Like it doesn't yeah. matter what what's happening. Or same thing with sellers, like they're going to move and they, they want to get out of their house, and that's what's going to. And there's all these people that have been sitting on the sidelines, and I I imagine, and my prediction here is that there's a lot of sellers that are afraid of how fast paced the market is, sure, because they don't they're worried about where they're going to go. 
Yeah. They're trying to figure out, okay, well, we don't know what we want. Maybe mm-hmm. we need to go into a rental. We don't want to be out of here in 60 days. And we want to take our time. And if you look at the people that own a lot of real estate right now, it's the baby boomers. Mm-hmm. They, I don't think they want to be rushed out of their homes. I think they want to do this on their terms. Right. And there's some fear about the fast pace of this market right now. Absolutely. I mean, I think that one of that's the biggest um, thing that you get is you're talking to people who are thinking about selling. Like, yes, I want to sell, but where am I going to go? And we, you know, have different ways of handling that. But that certainly is the most common thing that I hear as far as like an objection or a concern for moving forward with, you know, with listing. Um, I think that for buyers, there are enough of them out there that with this inventory being where it is, um, we're still going to see all of these sales going through regardless of if rates go up. Um, If you have to move, you have to move and you may have to shift. Um, You know, I think what I typically talk to people about is the importance of your monthly payment. You know, you have to look and you have to see what is it that I can afford to put towards my housing cost here, you know, your mortgage taxes, all of that for the month and then kind of determine from there. So as you are looking at the rates changing, you know, the calculations come through. You may see that you might have to look at something a little bit differently than what you've been looking at before. But um, there are enough people out there that are motivated and need to move that um, the people that are on the fence will either stay on the fence or some of them have now been on the fence for so long that while they were initially people that, you know, could handle, um, like, let's say it's a, a growing family and space is tight. And they thought they were going to ride this out. Oh, we're fine for another year or two until things, you know, shift a bit or are a bit more favorable. Um, now they might be in a position where they're no longer just kind of comfortable where they are until things change. They may be in a position where it's it's time to do something. So I think that there is more than enough people out there to to purchase. So I, I agree wholeheartedly. So knowing that we, we see rates going up and, and prices still going up. I think that, that that's pretty clear. There's three groups of people I want to hit on real quickly. If you're a seller, if you're a buyer, and if you're an agent, what should you be doing in the current climate? So let's start with sellers. You're, you're advising a seller. They're saying, well, Sarah, should we wait? Should we not wait? What would you be saying to that person? Well, I guess I would want to see what their motivation for the move is, um, what they kind of see themselves in, what what this like next step looks like for them. And then can we line it up? What would we get for the sale of your home now? Um, what would be potentially a temporary living situation until you can move from point A to point B? Um, because, you know, if you're if you need to sell in order to buy your next one, you're always going to have to do that no matter what the market mm-hmm. is, right? So you may always need to have a little piece that is like an in-between spot. Um, so I think just kind of running through the scenarios and seeing if this is what we want to get to, how do we make the pieces fall in place to do it? And you know, now is probably the time to, to cash out and get the most from this investment um, while the buyer pool is still strong. So- you, you said very well said. I mean, it, you know, what's your situation? Do you have a backup place to go? All that. I would be personally probably a little more aggressive with sellers because, yeah. I mean, we've even seen it in some of the education that we've done or our training where it went from like 10 offers coming in. Now you only got two mm-hmm. and both of these have inspections or right. you're starting to see the terms change, not so much the values, but the right. terms, because right. that's how people were competing. So if I was a seller, I'd be looking at the next six months as a really great window to sell my home and get out Mm -hmm. and maybe be okay with renting somewhere if you don't know where you want to go or go into that short-term place. Because if rates continue to go up, even though realtors are the ones talking about it more than buyers, in in my view, if if they they go up, what's going to happen is people's affordability is just going to drop. So Mm -hmm. depending on what segment of the market you're in, what the house is like, it's all relative to a certain extent. I wouldn't be waiting because if there's a need to sell in six months, you can probably move that timetable up to right now. Right. And and there's still all this demand out there because we got a really incredible demand and the supply is obviously very light. Right. And I mean, I think, you know, we often talk about both on the buy side and the sell side as you're looking at writing an offer or accepting an offer, the importance of both pricing and terms and how they both have a very huge weight Mm -hmm. on what that offer looks like. And when you get down into the nitty gritty of the terms of the offer and what all people 
you know, at one point are waiving and what that actually can equal out to in dollars if they're not waiving it. Um, not to mention just the uncertainty of will this make it to the settlement table, which is the ultimate goal. So, um, Absolutely. you know, kind of taking some of that uncertainty out of it or being able to buffer it as much as you can um, certainly has a lot, a lot of weight. Got it. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. So what about the buyer? That's like, I don't want to wait. I'm not finding what I want. What, what, what are you telling that person? So um, with that person, I mean, there are two years ago, <laughs> there were a lot of people that were, you know, saying, I want to wait for things to cool down. And most of them, like when we then did go through and um, and get to the other side of a transaction, we're like, man, I should have done this. Mm -hmm back when I initially wanted to. We don't know what exactly is going to to come next, but we do know that the buyer pool is strong, that rates are going up, and that um, there is, what, 2.2 months supply of inventory. So we're not in a, a balanced market yet. Um, and if this is something that you are wanting to move forward with, we have to do it, um, you know, we have to be prepared to be competitive. Um, but waiting is not the solution. Waiting isn't going to save you money. You know, I've also had many people that, you know, were kind of thinking, well, I want to hold off for another year or two because I want to save up more money for a down payment. Mm -hmm. And like the cost of waiting can be very real, whether it's that you are renting. So now you're currently paying all of this money towards your rent while you're trying to save, while interest rates go up, while home prices go up, mm -hmm. or selling. Like you now is a great time to be able to, you know, to to put your home on the market and to take advantage of the people that are out there. So um not take advantage of them, but take advantage, take advantage of, of the, the conditions. Yeah. The no, conditions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't I didn't take it any other way there. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I mean, I think for for buyers, if you're serious, like this is this is still a great time to to get out there. And we are starting to see a little bit more flexibility with some of the terms that um, we're able to get offers accepted with these days. Yeah, we've seen inspections get accepted, buying the home at the asking price, which is unheard of. And, yeah. and so I totally agree with you there. Um, wait, there is a cost to waiting and it's really got to be the right decision for the consumer ultimately. But if you're trying to figure out like, hey, when's like the best time, way for me to time this, then right. it, I, I would say don't wait. And we've been saying that for, I think as, as soon as we started doing this radio show since the past couple of years, right. and it, it's proven to be correct. So the last group, before we take a quick break, knowing that we're seeing the market start to shift a little bit, what should real estate agents be doing right now? I think that real estate agents need to get like one back to, to basics um, in Love terms that of- uh, you know, outreach um, in terms of, you know, being on the phone or or getting out there, making connections, building your pipeline and being aware of what is going on in the market and what is going to get your offer accepted um, or for your uh, if you are on the listing side, you know what that ideal offer looks like so that you can properly advise and and guide your people. You don't want anybody leaving money on the table or mm -hmm. or you know, paying more than they need to or getting less than they need to. So knowing what is currently going on and what factors you can write into an offer and, you know, for the listing side, maybe not rejecting, um, you know, something that does have some conditions in there um, that it's you need to know what what's happening today in order to best advise your clients. I could not agree with you more. I see three things. I'm going to and it's it's similar to what you said. One is Get informed about the market. If mm -hmm. you can't explain this stuff and have a competent conversation of, here's the outlook, here's what inflation means, here's where rates are going, here's how the 10-year T-bill, you're, you're going to be in some trouble because other agents are boning up on that. And, and now people have more questions than ever because there's a little economic uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, remember during 2020, the uncertainty that was there, and it was the agents that best educated their clients, yeah. they're the ones that sold the most real estate. So that's number one, be the knowledge broker. You, you said it beautifully, number two, Talk to more people. You can't just show up and sell the house anymore because you caught the right lead. Because low rates bring out everybody. And right. sometimes people are just going to buy. They're like, I'm buying this house. I don't care what's getting in my way. They could be dealing with no agent, an incompetent agent, a great agent. They're buying that house. Whoever talks to that person is the one that gets in there. Now lead nurturing has become a thing again. It takes some time to get people down the pike. Uh, it takes some time to get them to a decision-making point. So I, I, I'm talking about picking up the phone, 
because calling your leads works, despite what people say. Outbound activity like you talked about, because it's going to take seven, eight, nine attempts to get a new appointment. And the third one, and I, I would say people need to be a little more patient than they used to, because a lot of agents, like, they wanted to, like, okay, I got the call. I'm going to go sell them a house. Yeah. Like, I mean, how? I and mean, we saw a lot of that. It, it was real. Now that we're into a, a little bit of a different market, you know, 2018 and 2019 was not a bad market for real estate agents. It wasn't some horrible market like people thought. So I'd be looking at just being a little more patient, understanding you're in a 90 day cycle, not a 30 day cycle. And that's going to be really critical here. So yeah, and I, th I think also just as you're talking to <laughs> your clients, really getting down to, you know, what is what is the why? What is the reason for doing it and helping them sometimes get out of their own way because mm -hmm. there's always something going on. Like, I mean, <laughs> look at our world today. Like, I think I saw like a pretty funny meme the other day that was, um, it might've been like the broke agent or something. All right, <laughs> but, the broke um, agent. I think it was like, you know, it was a screenshot of a text conversation that was probably like made up. But um, a client was like, oh, I think I'm gonna wait and see how this monkey pops Oh yes, I did see this. Rolls out, yeah. And it's like, there's always, there's always something. So just kind of helping them realize like, is this a real thing that we really need to be considering right now? Or like, do we put everything on hold because of monkeypox? Or do we, you know, move forward? So, um, you know, I think just kind of being aware that conditions are always going to be there. 100%. Yeah. And, and that's why it's even more important to talk to more people because when the market's really hot, everyone wants to buy. Right. When you see these low rates and everything else, when the market starts to turn, to me, I find that the most informed consumers are still transacting and they know what they're doing, but there's a lot of people that just don't have the right information, and that's really what, where it's critical for agents to do that. I, I, I did see the monkeypox thing, by the way. So another brilliant post from the broke it's agent. So good. Actually, we, and when I saw it, I actually, like, I don't know. I usually listen to NPR while I'm driving around, and that's how I, like, keep up to date on stuff. But I guess I hadn't been driving for a little bit. I don't know. I wasn't even aware of the monkeypox, and then uh, I saw it on the news, and I was like, oh, that is real. Apparently, it's been warmed about. Um, I, I, I just Googled it here, and it's uh, it's a real thing. But uh, I, I'm not, I'm trying to watch less negative news or just less news in general. So, right, right. All right. So 2018, pretty similar. Be aware of the facts. Great stuff, Sarah. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. And Bill McCormick just walked in from CK Capital Management. We're going to have him jump on the next segment here. We're going to talk about is reality TV good or bad for real estate? Very interesting argument. And then uh, Bill's going to tell us about – his whole company, what they do. They've helped a lot of our clients, so we're excited for that. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. Buying a home Bill, or up, already man? own one? We can help. I am Kevin Hamill from Alliances Insurance Agency. If you haven't reviewed your policies in the last three years, now's the time. New home buyers, there are a number of ways that we can help you get to that settlement table. Call us to find out more at 610-816-0043, extension 3, or visit our website, alliancesinsurance.com. Don't forget the S, it's for savings. Have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? Whether you have a license or not, call us today at 610-692-6976 or visit tomtool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline. The Tom Tool Sales Group is the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania with over $165 million in volume for 2021. I'm Tom Tool, and our team has achieved that kind of success by being a great place to work with and to work for. No one knows Greater Philly better than we do. We know real estate, but more importantly, we're real people. We hire the best agents and we give them all the tools to succeed. Even our brand new agents sell 17 to 24 homes a year because our team delivers the best experience in real estate. Teams deliver a better experience than individuals and we're a top 1% real estate team in the country. We call it AAA service. We're your advocate, ally, and advisor. Because this isn't a transaction to us. It's a relationship. If you're buying or selling a home, call the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Main Line at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. That's Tom, Tool with an E, dot com. Sell your home for more and remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. For the best local mortgage service and great rates on your money, look no further than Mortgage America. We've been operating in the greater Philadelphia area for 40 years with a focus on smooth, easy access to home purchasing. Whether you're a first-time buyer, upsizing or downsizing, or just refinancing, we have programs for you. We also have closing cost assistance programs and access to subsidized interest rates. Pre-approval is free, no costs or commitments. To learn more, 
more, visit our website at mymortgageamerica.com or give us a call at 610-439-8000. We always have a person available to take your call with around-the-clock human service. Purchase your home with the personalized, local service you find at Mortgage America. Mortgage America is an equal housing lender. NMLS 128501. Welcome back to Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Timon, and we've got Bill McCormick sitting in from CK Capital Management. We're going to talk about all about their company in the final segment here of the show today. And again, we Sarah and I work with the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline, the number one Remax team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And there was a little bit of a kerfuffle, if, if you say. Oh, a uh, kerfuffle. Uh, I don't know. So I've worked on that to make sure I pronounced it right. Um, recently at a, um, between Ryan Serhant and Bess Friedman. So, uh, uh, or, uh, and Bess Friedman is the CEO of Brown Harris Stevens. Um, and that's a, um, uh, she, that, that's a, that's a company that deals with luxury real estate. Ryan Serhant is from Million Dollar Listing. You've probably seen him before. Now he's come up with his own brokerage, a media company, all sorts of stuff. And they, on Thursday, they had The Real Deal, which is a real estate news website. They had a New York City showcase and forum, and they had a panel with uh, Bess Friedman and Ryan Serhant, and also the Douglas Elliman CEO, Scott Durkin. Um, and so these two people, Ryan Serhant and Bess Friedman, they started getting into it over real estate reality TV being good for the industry and uh, she described it as horrible, and she thinks reality TV um, is very deflating to what we do because I think it makes it look effortless. Um, then she went on to talk about Selling Sunset, which I think is – I've never even seen that show. Have you? So actually I have. Okay. Well, what's Selling Sunset? I don't even know. So, so it's out in L.A., these like, you know – ridiculous homes um that are you know sure. like multi 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 million dollars um and it's you know like a group of i think it's all just like hot young girls that are the agents so that's um, what she did say that it, that, yeah. that was part of the problem so keep going um i mean it was it was entertaining but it's it's reality tv you know it's i think you have to take all of it with a grain of salt and you know know that they're doing it for entertainment not necessarily to give the ins and outs of the actual like what goes on in a real estate transaction. I mean, people wouldn't watch it if they were watching you like looking for comps and <laughs> like, I have a pretty boring day to day. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> like, you know, all of the, you know, phone calls back and forth, like not just the like high pressure ones where it's like, you know, deals off, <laughs> but yeah. like, you know, the actual like negotiating and figuring out and problem solving. I mean, people aren't going to they're not going to tune in to see that. They want to see so and I think also from the side of it of being in the business, like I can watch it and know what they're just kind of fast forwarding through or what they're doing for, you know, just mm -hmm. to have viewers um, versus looking at it as like, oh, wow. So that's that's what it is to to be an agent, you know, so. So th that was actually part of her point. I'm, I'm glad you have some perspective there because I, I try not to watch these shows because they make me bananas. Right. Yeah. Uh, just because I know what it's actually like. So. What, what, what she said was that it makes the consumer think all you have to do is look cute, have a fancy car, and boom, you can do a deal. And Ryan Serhant came back and said the old way of selling real estate has completely changed. Uh, buyers are influenced by younger people in the industry. Um, I do think there's a point there that there is a change in the industry and doing things that they, the way they were done like 40, 50 years ago isn't going to be the most effective but they really got into it, and then uh, it got to the point where they said, now "Hey, that could have made a good reality TV show." Yeah, I, well, <laughs> I mean, probably. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the fact that we're even talking about it is it shows you how. And I, I think there is something to, to be said here. Um, and what Best Friedman went on to say is that the real estate industry is under attack by lawmakers over the commission structure, and these shows perpetuate a myth that real estate is glamorous, get rich quick, easy, and that's why it's sort of fair game to come after real estate professionals. It's also another piece to consider when you look at uh, put out the narrative on a big platform and all the eyes are looking at it. So this went on and on. Uh, what do you think about this argument here? And Bill, feel free to chime in as well. Sure. I mean, I can I can see where she's coming from in that if you just, you know, look at some of these little clips, it can make our job look easy. Um, but I feel like for 
any re- I mean and so I actually I don't watch a ton of reality TV Neither I, do I I don't know why I actually watch this might be the only reality show I've watched like in any recent in any recent years and I haven't seen the most recent season but um you know I think it's I forget where I was going with that. Um, <laughs> but uh, any reality TV show, I think, can make anything look easy or anything look hard. It's the the way that they do their plot twists and, um, you know, what they kind of line up behind the scenes. I'm sure that, like, half the arguments that they're having on the show were, like, pre-planned arguments or half, you know, any obstacles that they came across were either like written in or or planned for. Um, And I think that goes for any reality show that's out there. So you have to, you know, be aware of reality TV is not actual reality. Mm -hmm. It is TV. And there are snippets of different things in there. Um, You know, I think that for Million Dollar Listing, you know, he he took advantage of the fact that there are tools available today that were not. I mean, there's no way this could have been a thing 40 years ago. He made you know? nine thousand dollars his first year his first in real year, estate. Yeah. So it's you know I think that it's being aware of what sells, what people look for, what gets people attention, and what gets you clients. And a lot of that is recognition. And um, you know he he took advantage of an option and went out and and you know his like. Selling Sunset certainly, I think, is a bit like sexier than Million Dollar <laughs> Listing. You know, like there's there's a absolute vibe with Selling Sunset that goes along with everybody's appearance and and everything. And I I feel like on Million Dollar Listing, um, it's you know everybody is like attractive, but it's it's not. It doesn't have the exact same vibe. It's a different. It's a different show. <laughs> so, I mean, that that's a really great point. And I, I, I actually do agree with – I've never seen Selling Sunset, but if it's like what you're telling me, I think there is an issue with, with some of the things that go on in these shows. Sure. But they're also there to get viewers on television not to sell real estate. Right. Ryan Serhant took an opportunity mm-hmm. and turned it into a, a, a monster career in the business where if – like, I mean – He's gone on and started his own brokerage. I mean, they're, they're, they're a real mega team in, in New York City, one of the, arguably the most competitive markets. They don't even have an MLS there. Right. So I give him a lot of credit for seeing the opportunity here. I, yeah. I don't agree that, you know, that I don't think this TV show has anything to do with the DOJ coming after real estate agents. Real estate is an industry that has been very deregulated. And I think the bigger problems come from NAR and these MLS rules and these made up things that happen, not a reality TV show about real estate. I want to be very clear. I, I don't agree with that at all. And I also don't agree with that. Th- there's there's a lot of things that Ryan Serhan and people like him are doing that are pretty innovative, like mm-hmm. marketing on social media. Like, yep. I mean, it, you know, that's it, it, I'm, it's a very dumbed down version of what they're doing. Right. But that's something that obviously is a tool and you can grow your business that way. There's no question. And he's done it at scale. Right. Um, I mean, we put out three different video shows a week at our team. Mm-hmm. It's not much different from what he's doing. We're just not on Bravo, right? right. And yet, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if I'd I'm ever want to be on one of those TV shows for a lot of reasons. Um, but you know, he, he's a legitimate business person, and right. and he deserves a lot more credit than I think people give him. I, I, I don't agree with that. That it, uh, but the, the, the flip side of what she's saying is like, you know, how they post like the commission on million dollar listing. Mm-hmm. That's like net top level. It doesn't have marketing expenses in there. It doesn't right. have. You know what? What it costs to like the time involved to sell these mm-hmm. places. I mean, they're selling twenty-five million dollar properties. Sometimes that's not done in a day or two. I mean, that's that's you know. I mean, think about the longest you've worked with a client, and it probably wasn't even close to twenty-five right. million. Right. Right. Yeah, so yeah. And, and so I, I you, you bring up a good point. Well, I, we've never done it. I mean, that just doesn't happen here. You bring up a good point that you don't see like the boring, mundane stuff, like sitting on the phone and making two hundred calls a day to find, get one appointment set, or right. going through all these offers. And trying to find the issues with them and understanding them or, you know, having those tough conversations with people. Like right. we're not going to Justin Timberlake's barbecue place at New York City and negotiating a deal. That never happens. Right. Uh, so right. There, is, there is some part of that, but it's reality television. So I, I don't totally agree with either side here, but I don't think Ryan Serhan, I actually would say he didn't say anything wrong here. I think it's more right. of a bad opinion from uh, uh, Bess Friedman where she's. I, I get where she's coming from, but it sounds. I get this image in my head of like the old man, like shaking his hand, yelling right. at a cloud. That's kind of what it sounds like to me. Right, and I mean, I think that these two shows, while they both are, you know, obviously real estate focused, um, 
they're different shows. Um, and, you know, I think with a lot of reality TV shows, um, for what they're on there for, a lot of the people that are on them are trying to find their break to to mm -hmm. get famous. Like, not necessarily because this is the industry they're really trying to be in or this is what they really want to do. It's, you know, they may have gotten a call from a casting agent saying, like, you know, we need people to come in and, and audition for this or do this. And they view it more as a step to further, like, an acting career or a modeling career or something that isn't related to the reality show that they're on, you know? So I think that you have to take that into consideration as well um, as you're as you're looking at some of this. I, I, I totally agree with you. And what I know is that, I mean, it, it's television. It's entertainment. Of course, right. they're going to make it look sexy and glamorous. That's kind of the whole job because people, it's, Reality TV, they should call it like non, non-real non reality TV or something, because right. none of this stuff is what happens in real life. Right. I don't watch it either. Bill, what do you think? Well, I saw an interview just uh, yesterday, day before, with Bethany Frankel um, from Real Housewives. Oh, wow, okay. And and she, she went on that show um, for whatever reason she did, but she said she's parlayed that. I mean, number one, she sold Skinny Girl cocktails for a billion mm -hmm. dollars, whatever it was. Yes. And she said, I use that as my stepping stone. She's written books now. She's got clothing lines. And I think that's a lot of what this reality TV show is. Mm -hmm. I don't think Ryan Serhan, when he started this with Frederick, I mean, that was really, they were just nuts back then. Mm -hmm. And it was all about their, their rivalry. Um, he took advantage of, of, of the market and the opportunity. I agree, Sarah, what you said that the the selling sunset the only thing i know about that is from my 31 year old daughter who is in real estate uh -huh. um down in in uh in dc is blonde and drives a nice car and she said oh my god th th this isn't even a, a real this isn't one tenth of what i do in a day right. and, they're, and they get it done you know in the 30 minute show or whatever right. it is right well, you bring up a good point. It's a vehicle for your own business, and the people that use that, like it, it's no different than any platform. If you're putting YouTube YouTube videos up, right? I mean, or you're putting stuff out on your social media accounts, it's just another platform to promote your business. And if you approach it that way, to me, that's smart business. That's not irresponsible. So, sounds like we're all on the same page here. Maybe I, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree, or I don't agree that it's bad for the real estate industry. I think you got to know how to take advantage of it for your own business. I agree, and yeah. it, I, I think perspective. Uh, here today is it used to be Facebook. Now a lot of it's being driven by Instagram, and mm -hmm. now it's TikTok, right? So how can you get more followers? TV, Bravo, you have millions of millions of viewers, and and that's a market. But there's all other ways now with social media that you can still grow your business without having to act like an idiot uh, on TV <laughs> right. uh, one hour every week. <laughs> well said. So we're gonna take a quick break. So we all agree, not bad for the industry, maybe a little over the top. Ryan Serhant played it right. I think that's the consensus here. So we're going to come back. We're going to talk with Bill McCormick from CK Capital Management. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. You shouldn't have to deal with all the red tape when getting your mortgage from a big or online bank. At Mortgage America, we have access to big bank money, but with the personalized and detailed service of a local bank. We are here in your community and ready to serve with fast settlements, low down payment options, and first-time homebuyer programs. Pre-approval is free, no costs or commitments. For more information, visit our website at mymortgageamerica.com or give us a call at 610-439-8000. Have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? Whether you have a license or not, call us today at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline. Buying a home or already own one? We can help. I am Kevin Hamill from Alliances Insurance Agency. If you haven't reviewed your policies in the last three years, now's the time. New home buyers, there are a number of ways that we can help you get to that settlement table. Call us to find out more at 610-816-0043, extension 3, or visit our website, alliancesinsurance.com. Don't forget the S, it's for savings. I'm Tom Tool of the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline. If you're thinking of becoming a real estate agent in the greater Philly area, I have a special offer for you. Our team did $165 million of volume in 2021, making us the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania and a top 1% team nationally. Our agents love us because we offer them a successful career, a great life, and an unbeatable culture. Agents who've been with us for at least a year average 30-plus sales. 
Even our brand new agents average 17 to 24 sales a year. We offer proven systems and expert training. We help you set more appointments and sell more houses. Now here's the offer. If you don't have a real estate license yet, we offer real estate scholarships so you can get one for free. Check it out at realestatescholarshipprogram.com or visit the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline at tomtool.com. That's Tom Tool with an E dot com. Get more out of your real estate career and remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. All right, all right, all right. We are back on at Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Timon. And we both work with the Tom Tool Sales Group, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we've got a special guest, Bill McCormick on from CK Capital Management. So, Bill, why don't you tell everyone what CK Capital does? Obviously, we worked with you. I know all this stuff. And a little bit about where people can contact you because... You guys do something that I found has almost impossible for anyone else to get done in the, in the marketplace. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Tom. And uh, you know, this market right now, um, it, it, it's uh, the result for us in our business in the distressed uh, uh, property business uh, has been a little bit slow. Um, we found that our company, CK Capital, uh, twenty years ago. My wife, who's also my business partner, Denise, and primarily what we do is we help people that are facing foreclosure. They're upside down on their mortgage. They can't afford it anymore. Rather than go through the foreclosure process, we get them out from under the debt with minimal impact to their credit score. And it basically gives them the ability to go become a new homeowner in a shorter period of time versus a foreclosure. Um, uh, our offices are down in Wilmington, Delaware. We also have an office over in Chad's Ford, and we have an office uh, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, so we service primarily Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Jersey, Virginia. Um, we have a couple of transactions right now in Hawaii, um, Florida, and New York. So wow. it's a referral business just like yours is. Um, but uh, right now, we are really seeing a hangover effect in our business as a result of a couple of things. One, obviously, the equity that's, that's being created in this last couple of years just due to the market. Um, we're not seeing as many distressed properties out there because even though folks may have lost their job during the pandemic or been downsized or maybe had some other life event where they can't afford the mortgage anymore, just due to the the uh, equity that was created over the last two years, even if they are struggling, they can sell their home and still walk away with money and live to fight another day. Um, but the hangover effect that we're experiencing right now uh, is a result of two things. The CARES Act that was launched in March 2020, it provided two protections to homeowners. Mm -hmm. One was you had the mortgage forbearance program yep. that allowed a homeowner that was impacted due to COVID, they could go to their lender, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, and they could request to have a 6, 12, up to an 18 months of payment holiday. And those folks that went into the program March, April of 2020, they just exited out of the program October, November of 2021. And um, that equity that they had, if they hadn't paid a mortgage for 18 months, well, that all gets put on the back end of the mortgage. Yep. Yep. So we're seeing a little bit of a break even there where maybe they don't have the equity. And the other thing that we're seeing is um, the more, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, um, the foreclosure moratorium that went into place March 2020. That expired in August of 2021. And then on the heels of that, you had the courts that were actually shut down during the pandemic due to social distancing. So there is inventory out there that is in process of being foreclosed on. And, and uh, what we're seeing now is folks that have not paid a mortgage in two and a half, three and a half. I just spoke to a client the other day, had not paid a mortgage in five years and was not foreclosed on. They fell between the cracks. But five years? Yeah. Yep. Does that seem pretty wild to you, Sarah? That is super wild. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like it would be hard to ever make a payment again if you just like started living your life without paying a mortgage payment or any type of like you know rental or. <laughs> yeah, during the pandemic, um, the lenders weren't allowed to foreclose, yeah. so a lot of these people just got extra time. And yeah. quite frankly, it will help us out. It'll help our inventory when the courts get caught back up and the mortgage companies get caught back up with this foreclosure filings because it'll give us more inventory out there in the secondary market. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that, 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 that's kind of wild to me that, that that's happened, but I've seen it on the eviction process and other, I mean, there's renters that haven't paid rent for like two years and we, we deal with a lot of landlords where they're like, I haven't been able to collect rent mm-hmm. and, and they can't even sell the property. So it, it does make sense. Um, I, I know personally, and Sarah has had some clients that work to it as well. I found that negotiating these short sales, it's really tough if you don't know what you're doing. And there's a lot of people that try it, some agents that try it themselves what works so well with your company? Because I don't think I've ever referred you somebody that you weren't able to help. Yeah, it, you know, it, it, this is a very niche business. And back in 2007, seven eight, when the market completely imploded due to the mortgage companies, our competition wasn't attorneys doing short sales, um, title companies mm-hmm. facilitating. It was realtors doing their own short sales. And, and um, it, it, it's time and experience. I mean, I have a, a financial services background And due to the fact we've been doing it so long now, we have the contacts inside of Bank of America. We have the contacts inside of Wells Fargo. And the only thing that I say to realtors that when if you are doing your own short sales, the thing you have to remember is your E&O insurance (laughs) covers you for being a realtor. It has nothing to do with debt management. If you give legal advice, if you give tax advice, if anything that comes back on you, congratulations, potentially you and your broker could be in hot water uh, because you did not, you're not doing a realtor job. You're doing debt management. I love that answer because have you ever seen realtors try to like dispense legal advice to people? And I mean, I I know I have, and I I think it's a dangerous place to advise. Slippery slope. (laughs) Slippery slope is a good way to put it. So, uh, and if you want to uh, check out uh, Bill's company, it's ckcapitalmanagement.com. So, you have a niche business. You've got the right contacts. Who's the kind of person that should be talking to you? Because I, I think a lot of folks, and I've seen this happen, where they kind of ignore these problems when they come up. They fall behind on their mortgage, or they don't want to deal with it. I know you just dealt with a client kind of like that, where they had like their ex-husband living in the property. They couldn't get. I mean, it's it's really screwy situations. It also happens more than you would think. Yeah, and and, and the most common reasons for for property distress is you know you've lost your job. You know, somebody got sick, um, uh, somebody died, uh, someone's getting divorced. You've had a change in your economic status. So, unfortunately, bad things happen to good people all the time. You know, in the good economy and a mm-hmm. bad economy, these things are still going on. And quite frankly, the, the homeowners now, they are a lot more educated than they used to be. Um, and we used to primarily focus in on, you know, how do we find those distressed homeowners? Now, the distressed homeowners, if they are in a position, most times they are reaching out to their realtor to say, hey, look, I spoke to, you know, my neighbor Betty down the street. She sold her home. I realized I don't have the ability to keep up with the payments anymore, and I see what Betty sold her house for. I'm going to reach out to realtor to see if they can help. So, and, you know, how many payments do they need to fall behind? Because I know there's there's this whole, like, qualification process, too, where a lot of people, they – I mean, they're borrowing from family members and they're doing things just to keep the house when in reality they might now, like you said, prices have gone up a lot. So it's easy to get out of these homes. What like talk a little bit about like the criteria for a short sale, because I don't think a lot of people understand what it, what it means and, and, and how you actually like can qualify for something like this. Yeah, a great, great question. So, I mean, basically, there's two things that qualify for a short sale. One is, is there de- demonstrated financial hardship, that job loss or divorce death? Um, and the second thing is, is the value of your home underwater? meaning there's not enough to pay off your loan in full. So those those are the two primary requirements. But for the homeowners, most lenders pre-COVID, after about five to six months of missed payments, all right, that initial five months was really more collection activity. Can you pay your mortgage? Will you be able to bring your loan current? What's happening on? What's happening? Is it a short-term or a long-term thing? At the end of that five, six-month period, they realize they're not going to get payment then the mortgage lenders in our state of Pennsylvania, they have to hire a local attorney. The attorney goes into the courts and does a civil filing called a list pendants. It's another five to six months. So typically that homeowner has missed a minimum of 11 to 12 payments before the lenders will actually hold a sheriff's sale. Okay. So how many payments would they need to miss in order to qualify for getting a, a short sale like approved with, with their bank? And I, I don't know if it varies based on the banks or, or how that works. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, most, most the standard is, is five to six months. Um, they'll, they'll give them that much time um, to try and bring the loan current before they initiate the foreclosure action. But the one thing the consumer, the homeowner needs to understand is at any point in time prior to a scheduled sheriff's sale, 
if they have the ability to bring a loan current, they can stop all foreclosure proceedings and continue right along. Got it. Got it. So, Sarah, what kind of questions do you have? I mean, I, I know I'm asking a lot of like technical stuff here. I know you come at it from a very different perspective than I do. So I guess at what point for that, like if the homeowner knows that they are falling behind, but they haven't gotten all of, I mean, is the sooner the better, I'm guessing, to come to you? Um, you know, if they just know they're not going to be able to make payments, but they maybe haven't gotten anything official yet from the mortgage lender saying, you know, like, we haven't gotten your payment. Yeah, it, it, it's human nature. Um, you'll get some folks that realize early on, hey, I, I've lost my job or I'm getting divorced. We can't afford the home anymore. And then they'll reach out to a realtor to say, hey, look, I need some assistance. And most times it, it's the realtors, the listing agents who we work with mm -hmm. to help their clients out. Um, but the other part of that is that there are some homeowners that will literally stick their head in the sand, unfortunately, because it's traumatic. You're, yeah. you're losing your home. And they may wait till they receive the foreclosure papers. Yeah. At that point, they know, because that's in, in our counties locally, the sheriff shows up at the property. Yep. Oh, uh, okay. So call before the sheriff shows up is kind of what I'm Without hearing. a doubt. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. All right, Bill. So if you want to get in touch with Bill McCormick and CK Capital Management, we've had a great experience with them personally. It's ckcapitalmanagement.com. Bill, thanks for coming on, my man. Appreciate it. You want to follow Sarah, she's at Ty underscore Ty Time on Instagram. You can follow me at TomTool 3RD, at TomTool the third. And again, we stream live every week on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Just look up TomTool Sales Group. That's it for this week's episode. We'll catch you after Memorial Day.